presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Shirley Temple, Charles Winninger, and Gene Lockhart in Captain January. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. It's you who make stars. And you made Shirley Stemple, Temple a star long before she knew what a star was. A few years ago, when she was just learning the mysteries of spelling, which I've never been able to solve, she tried her newfound knowledge on signs along the street. Much to her astonishment, the letters on a theater marquee spelled her own name, and she couldn't imagine how it got there. Tonight, that name shines on our marquee with the title of the play, Captain January, adapted from one of Shirley's most successful pictures for 20th Century Fox. It's the story of a little girl named Star and a lovable old salt named Captain January and of what happened when fate tried to pull them apart. But with Charles Winninger and Jean Lockhart on Shirley's side, fate has a tough assignment. Of course, we can't please all the people all the time, but I'm inclined to think we'll hit a new high tonight. And who knows, perhaps everyone in our audience will imitate the lady who has just written us saying, thank you very much for last week's play and for a wonderful team of stars. I enjoyed them immensely, and I think I'll buy an extra package of Lux Flakes just to please you. I'm grateful to the lady, and our answer is that of course her decision pleases us. But best of all, we know it's going to please her, just as the play did. And that's always a safe prediction. Whether it's the very first package of Lux Flakes that someone has bought, or the hundred and first. Now we're off for the New England shore, and the stirring drama of Captain January. You'll hear Shirley Temple as the little girl whose name is Star, Charles Winninger as Captain January, and Jean Lockhart as Captain Nazaro. The curtain rises on Act One. <laughs> Fighting winter gale, lashing the rocky coast of Maine, whipping the dull green sea into a white frenzy of foam. Somewhere in this mad mountainous world, a sailing vessel rolls and pitches, her decks awash beneath the heavy seas. In a last desperate plea for mercy, she lifts her spar to the black sky, but mercy is denied. With a groan and a shudder, the gallant craft slips downward to her grave. Just off Great Rock. He dragged it up on the beach. You mean a boat from the Hunters? Yes, sir. And there was someone in it. Where is he now? At Great Rock? Yes, sir. I'll take you there, sir. Never mind. I'll find him myself. Captain January! Where are you? January! Yeah, over here! Take care over them rocks, sir. For oh, heaven's sake, you wanted me. I did, sir. But it's too late. She's gone. She? Who? A passenger off the Huntress. Then adrift half the day in an open boat. Come over this way, sir. There she is. May heaven rest her soul. This woman's been dead for hours. Aye, sir. Died saving the little one she did in her arms around her. Keeping the warmth of life in her. The little one? Was there someone else? Look here, sir, under the tarpaulin, warm and snug. Why, it's a child. A baby, sir, smiling like a little angel. That's the way she was when I took her from her mother's arms. Captain, we'll have to bring this child up to the village at once. Please, sir, if it's all the same to you, I'll just bring her along to my place. Your place? I hardly think a lighthouse is the proper place for a child, Captain. Why not, sir? I'm cozy up there, and you see, well, sir, it's like she was delivered into my hands. Like the Lord might have asked me to take care of her for a while. To sort of watch over her until he'd made his plans for her. You're a good man, Captain. All right. Take her along to the lighthouse. If anyone inquires after her in the village, I'll let you know. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Up you go, child. Wait. 
Did you find anything that might give us a clue as to who this child is? No, sir. Only this locket. It was held tight in the woman's hand. And that reminds me. She'll have to have a name, won't she? What kind of a name is there for a baby girl washed up on a stormy beach? With the weather clearing as she comes to shore. And the evening star peeping out from behind the clouds. Aye, that's it. Star. That's your name, child. We'll call you Star. for breakfast. Six thirty, almost lunchtime. And you can stop pretending you're angry. I don't believe it. Sit down, Cap. Coffee coming up. Hey, ain't you forgetting something? I don't think so. Let's see. I made my bed. I brushed my teeth. I... Oh, it's my birthday. Where's my present? Ah, no breakfast yet and she wants her <laughs> present. How do you know you got a present? You always give me a present. I give you a spank for every year, too. When will you have that? Not now, Cap. After breakfast. I feel tougher after breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you can pick your own time. But don't you go slipping any shingles in the seat of your britches like the last time. That spanking hurt me more than it did you. Honest, Cap. I didn't know there was a nail in it. Mm. It's been a long time, hasn't it, Cap? A long time? I mean, since you and me shipped together. Nine years today, Star. That's why you're having your birthday. But... I must be more than nine years old. I uh, maybe 11 or so. I don't know exactly. For all we know, maybe I'm 30, huh? Mm, maybe, but it's highly improbable. Cap, what did I look like when you fished me out of the water? I had to wring you out and hang you up to dry. Tell me all about the storm again. Now, now, now. You've heard about that storm every birthday. But it gets to be a bigger storm every time you tell it. How many miles did you swim towing the lifeboat with me in your teeth? I had the tow rope in my teeth, not you. Last time you told me it was me. Well, you're a year older now. <laughs> <laughs> Star, do you ever get lonely here? Lonely? It ain't much of a life for a lass living in a lighthouse. Who else No company? I huh? Why, I was thinking maybe, maybe this ain't the right kind of a life for a youngster. Maybe you ought to go away somewhere. Would you like to, Star? No, I wouldn't. But if you say that just once more, I will go away. And I won't come back either. Oh, Cap, you're always talking about my going away. Don't you know by now that I'm never going to leave here? i just like to make sure once in a while that I'm doing right. That you really want to stay, that's all. Oh, I do. I do. And that's the end of it. Understand? All right, honey, that's the end of it. Here now. I'll let you have your birthday present. Oh, Cap, what is it? There. You like it? Why... It's a locket. Oh, it's beautiful. Where'd you get it, Cap? It was in your poor mother's hand the night I found you. There's a picture inside. Here, I'll open it for you. I can do it. Cap, is that... Is that my mother? I reckon it is, lass. Your mother and you, it must have been taken soon after you were born. She... She was very beautiful, wasn't she? Aye, and you're a lot like her. I've saved it all these years till I thought you were big enough to know what it was and to take care of it. I will, Cap. I'm going to keep this forever and ever. Thanks, Cap. Well, my mother was very beautiful, and Cap says I look just like her. <laughs> That's funny, isn't it, Imogene? I mean, me being beautiful. But you never can tell, can you, Imogene? I might grow up to be beautiful. After all, I'll bet you weren't so much to look at when you were my age. But you're beautiful now, Imogene, and I love you very much. Well, what do you say? <laughs> That's better. Ah! Are you finished with the milking yet? In a minute, Cap. Hurry up, Imogene. Cap's waiting. If you hurry, I'll let you go into the village. The village? There's a few things we need from the store. Would you like to go? Sure I would. Right there, Cap. Imogene, will you please cooperate a little? I've got to go into the village. Morning, Star. Morning, Captain Jarrett. Hello there, Star. 
Captain Nazro. Happy birthday. Thanks. Say, are you coming over to the lighthouse tonight, Captain Nazro? Well, I don't know. Santa ain't invited me yet. Well, I'm inviting you right now. You come on over. Cap and I are having a surprise party all by ourselves. All right. But you better warn him I'm coming. Don't worry. I'll tell him to behave. See you tonight, Captain. I'll be there. Morning, Mr. Carp. Morning, Star. What can I do for you? We need another case of brass polish. Better send it over right away. And don't forget what we get off for being government. Be there tomorrow, Star. Tomorrow? We need it today. Well, I'll try, but there's a lot of summer folks up here already keeping me hopping. I'll do the best I can. All right. Say, how much are these lollipops? Three cents apiece. Three cents? What about the government discount? Oh, sorry. Two cents for you, Star. Thanks. So long, Mr. Carr. So long. Oh, Mr. Cobb. Yes, Miss Morgan? Who was that little girl? Star? Why, she's Captain January's girl. He's the lighthouse keeper. I see. I wonder why I haven't seen her in school. Well, I guess the teacher who was here before wasn't very strict about things like that. Yes, I know. That's why she isn't here now. I think I'll go and have a talk with that child. Miss Morgan tried to make me go right along to school, and I said I wouldn't. Oh, I was very polite, Cap. Honest. But I said I had to go home. Good for you. Now, go on. What happened then? Well, one thing led to another. And the next thing I know, she had me by the ear, dragging me along the street. She did, eh? Well, what did you do? Well, one thing led to another thing, and... And the next thing you know, why, she sat down. On the chair? No, on the street. How'd that happen? I don't know. I can't figure it out. Hmm. She tripped, eh? Well, what'd she say then? Well, I didn't wait to hear. I didn't think I'd better. I just ran. Good idea. Well, forget about it. She can't do anything mean to us, can she? <laughs> of course not. Remember, I work for the government. I am the government here. Yes, but I think she's government too. Well, don't worry. This is your birthday. All right, Cap. Who's there? Open up and find out. Oh, it's Captain Nazro. Nazro. Captain? Evening. Blind my eyes. Can't I even give a birthday party around here without you barging in? Pipe down, you Captain Wampus. I didn't come to see you. Here, honey. Here's your present. Oh, thank you. Look, Cap, another present. Uh, present. It ain't much, honey. I bet it ain't. Oh, look, it's a doll. A doll. Well, well, a doll. Well, well, what of it? Oh, it's beautiful, Captain Nazro. Thank you very much. Cap, you're going to invite Captain Nazro to stay to the party, aren't you? Well, I wasn't counting on it, but since he's here, sit down, Nazareth. Good. I'll fix a place for him. Whether you was counting on it or not, I'm here. And I'm going to stay for a while. Oh, you are, are you? Yes, I are. Time I was doing a little inspecting around this here lighthouse. They must have been daft in Washington appointing you an inspector. Why, you don't know the difference between a telescope and a tar barrel. The way you handle them, I guess there ain't any. Look at that brass work. Well, what's the matter with it? It's dirty. Yeah, it is not. The brass was... Clean till you rubbed your dirty gloves on it. Why, you fog bound old derelict? If you wasn't my host, I'd fire you right yeah, now. Yeah, and if I wasn't, mm, if you wasn't my guest, I'd quit. Come and get it, sailors. You know, it's nice to see you two getting on for a change. Yeah. Here, Captain Nedro, you sit right there. Thank you, Star. And you here, Cap. Yeah. Say, wh what's that thing there? What do you think it is? It's a cake, Captain Nedro. Isn't it nice? Mm, right pretty. Cap made it all himself. Oh, he did. Then I guess I'll just eat the candles. Now, listen here, you no good deck Cap, swap. stop it. Now, you sit right down and behave yourself. Come in. The door's open. Good evening. Oh, my goodness. Cap, it's stormy weather. The school teacher. Which one of you is Captain January, please? I'm Captain January. I'm Mrs. Morgan, the new teacher here. So, sit down, ma'am. Thank you. Captain January? Why isn't this child in school? Well, uh, I was aiming to send her next year. What you are aiming to do is of no importance. We have a compulsory education law in this state, and this child is old enough. How does she know how old I am? We don't even know ourselves. Don't be impudent. But I didn't mean to be impudent. I Captain just... January, this child is being brought up entirely without control. She's rude, disrespectful. She's being raised like an ignorant little heathen. Now, hold on, hold on. Oh, you might remember that this child is adopted. And it is well within the power of the school authorities to have her taken from you and sent to an institution if you fail to raise her properly. Uh, taken from me? Why? Why? Just a minute. Mrs. Morgan, I don't hold none with this mildewed old pirate. 
But when you say Star's been brought up ignorant, you're talking through your, your crow's nest. Why, she, she reads writing and writes down reading better than any 11-year-old on this coast. What do you mean, better than any 11-year-old? There ain't a 13 or 14-year-old here, here from here to Newfoundland that knows as much as Star. Oh, no, and there any 15-year-old either. Of course. As that goes. Or 16 or 17. Say, maybe I am 30. You talk about neglect, Mrs. Morgan. Why, I've been learning her from the best two books there is, the Bible and Bodish. And just what is Bodish, please? You never heard of Bodish? Why, it's one of the greatest books ever written, American Tactical Navigation by Nathaniel Bodish. Navigation. Fine reading for a girl of her age. Any objection to the Bible? Let me tell you, Captain. And let, let me tell you, ma'am. There ain't better reading in the world than the Bible and the Bodish. They both learn you to steer a straight course. I didn't come here to discuss reading matter. Please have a report to the schoolhouse for an examination next Tuesday. The school board will determine whether or not she's been neglected. And since you seem to think she has the intelligence of a child of 13, we'll call her 13 and give her the test for that age. Wait. Maybe... Maybe I'm only 10 or so. Well, I'll stand on 13. Very well. Tuesday morning, please. Good night. Cap, what was she talking about? An institution. No, don't worry your head about that. Nazra. Yeah? Uh, I'd like to speak to you for a minute. But, Cap... The party. Uh, it's something about the light, Star. We'll be right down. Come on up to the light, Nazareth. Well, you certainly are a lubber, January. What was the idea of insisting that Star was as smart as a girl of 13? Well, she is, ain't she? Sure, but why make it tough for yourself? Well, well I reckon I did put my foot in it. I'm afraid you did. After all, Star doesn't, doesn't even belong to you, you know. Doesn't belong to me. That's what I said. You got no legal right to her. You never even adopted her. She's more than adopted. She's part of me. That's all right. But taint the law. When you fished her out of the water, you should have turned her over to the authorities. Or tried to find out if she'd had any folks anywhere. I did try. Yes, you did. Well, I tried for a while. I couldn't keep trying forever. Anyway, she has no folks. They're all dead. Are they? How do you know? Well, they never come for her. No one's ever asked for her. And you're just hoping they never will. What business is it of yours? She's mine. She's mine. And nobody's going to ever take her from me. Lobsters! Get your lobsters. Lobsters here. Right in the water. Lobsters! Fresh lobsters! Baby lobsters! Fifteen cents! Hello! Hello! Lobsters! Fresh lobsters! Baby lobsters! What have you got there? Lobsters? Oh, no. They're shrimp, but don't tell anybody. Lobsters! You can't fool me. They're lobsters. All right. They're lobsters. Go away, will you? Get your lobsters! Fresh lobsters! You live in this place! Lobsters! Fresh from the water! I said you live in this place! Lobsters! Fifteen cents! I come from New York! Tourists! Lobsters! Baby lobsters! Do these things bite? Certainly they bite! I don't believe it! Look, Sonny, go away, please! I want to see if they bite! Well, if you have to, you have to! Go ahead! <laughs> See, they bite. Lobsters, fresh lobsters. How about a nice lobster, lady? Fifteen cents. No, thank you. Best you ever tasted. Just take one home and try it. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I'm living at the hotel. You see, I'm a tourist, too. Oh, I didn't mean that. He was just getting fresh. <laughs> I know. I was standing over there watching you. I wonder... I wonder if you'd tell me something. Sure, what? I wonder if you'd tell me... Where you got that locket you're wearing? That? Oh, Cap gave me that. Cap? Yes, he's my father, Captain January. Your father? I see. Laura, Laura, where have you been? Oh, come here, Bruce. Have you some change? I want to buy some lobsters. <laughs> lobsters? What for? It's all right, lady. I don't want you to buy them if you can't use them. Oh, real little native, aren't you? No, sir. I wasn't born here, if that's what you mean. You weren't? Oh, where were you born? I don't know. <laughs> that sounds sort of funny, doesn't it? But you said your father... Cap? Oh, well, he's not really my father. I just call him that. You see, he found me and... 
Well, what are you looking at me that way for? Go on, dear. What were you saying? I wasn't saying anything. I I gotta go home now. I'm late. Excuse Wait, me. Wait, your lobsters. They'll be all right. Oh, bye. Bruce. Laura, what is it? You look as if... Laura, are you ill? Bruce, listen to me. That child. I must know who she is. Find out for me. I must know her name. <laughs> Mr. DeMille and our stars, Shirley Temple, Charles Winninger, and Jean Lockhart, return in a moment with Act Two of Captain January. But first, let's go eavesdropping in a tiny apartment where a young bride is celebrating her birthday. Hello, darling. I just came up to say happy birthday. Why, Ellen, how nice. I can't stay a minute. Oh, but do let me show you the present Ted gave me. This lovely house coat. Mmm, gorgeous. And that stunning brooch. Is that from Ted, too? Oh, this? Oh, no, I got this for myself. So, spending Ted's hard-earned dollars. Oh, dollars, nothing. You'd expect to pay a dollar, but it cost 15 cents. Yes, that's the amazing bargain the makers of Lux Flakes are offering you for a limited time. A beautiful, gone-with-the-wind brooch for 15 cents and the opening tab from a large box of Lux. It's quite different from the Scarlet O'Hara brooch, which was so popular when we offered it last fall, even lovelier. The design was taken from a brooch worn and gone with the wind. In the center is a charming rosette of simulated jewels, a turquoise surrounded by five gleaming pearls. The round setting, almost two inches in diameter, is gold-finished in antique style with a graceful scalloped edge and a dependable safety catch on the clasp. This exquisite gone with the wind brooch is so smart, so fashion right, that we know it's going to be tremendously popular. And we're all set to fill your orders promptly. But don't delay. Send for your brooch at once. Now, here's what you do. Buy a big box of Lux Flakes. Tear off the opening tab at the top of the box. Mail this tab with your name and address and 15 cents in coin, no stamps, please, to Lux, Box 1, New York City. Lux, Box 1, New York City. We'll send you, with your brooch, an illustrated order blank for additional matching pieces. Ring, pendant, bracelet, earrings. All amazing bargains. This offer is good only in the United States. I'll repeat these directions for you later on in this broadcast. But now, here's our producer, Mr. DeMille. Act Two of Captain January, with Shirley Temple as star, Charles Winninger as Captain January, and Jean Lockhart as Captain Nazro. A few days have passed, and Tuesday has rolled round. Fateful Tuesday, when Star is to appear before the school board for her examination. She's told Captain January nothing of her meeting with the lady on the mainland, so the captain's only worry is how to help Star pass. Alone in the lighthouse, he studies a book of grammar, but his brow is furrowed with deep lines as he struggles with the conjugation of the verb to be. I was, you were... He was, we were, you, you were, they was, were. Uh, that can't be right. Something's all mixed up here. Oh, why didn't I go to school instead of running away to sea? Morning, Cap. Oh, hello, hello. What are you doing, Cap? Oh, nothing. I thought you were going to help me with my examination. Well, I am, I am. Uh, let's see. How uh, about starting off with a little grammar? Grammar? Oh, grammar? Oh. No, 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 no. They won't ask you anything about grammar. Uh, we'll begin with arithmetic. Uh, recite the multiplication by five table. Cap, that's kid stuff. Hmm? You've got to make it tougher than that. All right. We'll do the seven table. Go ahead. Cap, that's for babies. Eight years old, Cap. Eight years old? Eight years old and they know the multiplication by seven table? Sure they do. Never heard of it until I was 23. Well, all right, all right. Uh, we'll skip the arithmetic. Now, let's get on to geography. Oh, geography. I like that. Now, here we go. Now, uh, if you were sailing from Boston Harbor to China, to what point of the compass would you turn her nose on the second day out? Cap, I don't think that's the way they ask them. No, why not? 
Well, Captain Nazro said... Nazro, Nazro, always Nazro. Did I hear my name mentioned? Hello, Captain. Sit down. What do you want? Nothing with you, you desiccated old crawfish. But I thought I'd come and help Star get ready for the examination. You being so illiterate. Me illiterate? I can spell you down, write you down, read you down, and figure you down. And I can do it with my hands tied behind my back. No, you couldn't. You need your fingers to count on. Is that so? I'll bet you you can't count over ten without taking your shoes off. Look, fellas, I don't like to interfere with your fun, but fighting isn't going to help me pass this test. She's right, but this might help. What is it? Well, uh, you see, Star, I, I figured it might help things along if we knew the questions they was going to ask. Now, this here is the examination paper. I, I uh, borrowed it uh, from the schoolroom. Captain Nazro, that's cheating. It is? Of course it is, isn't it, Cap? Well, well, yes, it's a very delicate point. Uh, well, we'll talk about it later on. Let's see that paper, Nathan. Yeah. Now, Star, the first question. If a field is 87 and a half rods long and 43 and a quarter rods wide, what is the length of the diagonal drawn from the northeast corner to the southwest corner? Prove it. Well... What's the answer? Mm -hmm. uh, what's the answer, Nazra? Well, uh, uh, how much is a rod? How many fathoms? Would it do you any good to know? No. Well, then keep quiet. <laughs> uh, prove that heat expands. Wait a minute. What's that? That's the second question. But we didn't get the answer to the first one. Well, we're skipping the first one. <laughs> prove that heat expands. Prove that heat expands. What does it mean? Why, it means... Prove that uh, heat makes things bigger. Well, let's see. Sure it does. Look, it's hot in the summertime, isn't it? Well, the days are longer in summer than they are in winter. Well? Well, that's it. Sounds logical to me. Hundred percent. Say, this isn't so tough. What's number three? Write down from memory the quality of mercy speech from the merchant of Venice. The quality of mercy is not strained. Is that all? I, I think it goes on from there. Maybe, but my memory doesn't. Ah, uh, this is a put-up job. That old hatchet face of a school teacher is trying to frame us. Hey, let me see that paper. There's no child of 13 could answer this stuff. I can't answer it myself. Wait, wait. I, I think I've made a mistake. What? This, this is a high school examination. High school? I, so you can't even steal proper. I, I didn't know. I, I picked it up in the schoolroom. It said examination. How was I to know there's different tests for different ages? That's right. How was you to know? You'd never pass a 13-year-old test, did you? I could have passed one. Maybe when you were full grown. Look, fellas, we're not getting any place. I've got to leave for school soon. Oh, see, hey, I was thinking, uh, with me telling that Morgan woman that I was teaching Star from the Bible, uh, that's pretty up to be uh, uh, some questions about the Bible. Well, there, there ain't many children as up in the book as she is. I know, but Star, uh, uh, what are the four Gospels? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Fine. Now, remember that story I read to you last week about the prodigal son? Uh-huh. And the father said, bring out the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. Correct. But everybody wasn't merry, Star. There was a brother there and neighbors. Now, who was sorry the prodigal son came back? The fatted calf. Star! <laughs> gentlemen of the school board. I think you know why we are here today. This child, Star January, I believe they call her, is to take the 13-year-old test. Sit over there, please. Thank you. We also have another student here, a little gentleman from New York. Gerald is going to summer school this year. Sit down, Gerald, dear. Oh, all right. Judge Hardrow. Yes? Judge, I've invited you here for a very special reason. Mm -hmm. I don't believe this little girl is being brought up properly, but I let you judge that for yourself. You'll know what to do, I'm sure. I think so. Begin the examination, Mrs. Morgan. <clears throat> now, children, first we'll have an oral test. On the blackboard, you will notice a drawing of eight fishing schooners. Excuse me, but they aren't schooners, Mrs. Morgan. They're catches. What's that? You said schooners, but they're really catches. I don't believe that makes any difference. Oh, but it does. You see, a schooner carries its main mast midships, and a catch is more like a yawl. You see... That will be enough, please. Yes, ma'am. 
On the board, we have eight, uh, <clears throat> eight catches. If four could carry a load of 100 tons of fish and four could carry twice as much, how many tons could they all carry half-filled? Well, sir? Well, in the first place, I don't believe you could get 100 tons of fish on a catch. That's not the question. But the boat would sink. They couldn't carry anything. Be quiet. Yes, ma'am. Gerald, do you know the answer? Half filled, the eight boats could carry 600 tons of fish. Not on top of the water. No muttering, please. Thank you, Gerald. Now, Star, will you please define a relative pronoun? A what, ma'am? A relative pronoun. Surely you know that. No, ma'am. A relative pronoun is a pronoun that connects two clauses and has its antecedents in the other clause. Very good, Gerald. Wow. And now we'll have a test of words and power of description. Gerald, will you please tell us in your own words the story of one of William Shakespeare's plays? Well, once there was a man named, uh, Romeo. And there was a girl, uh, Juliet. Uh, Go on, dear. Well, uh, her family was called, uh... The Capulet. The Capulet. And his family were named, uh... Montague. Star, will you please stop annoying Gerald? I'm not annoying him. I just want to help him. Do you? And just what do you know of the story of Romeo and Juliet? Oh, we've got it over at the lighthouse. I read it twice. And you understood it, of course. Oh, sure. You see... These Capulets and these Montagues, they hated each other like poison. Never mind. So Romeo and Juliet, they couldn't meet. So they met in the garden sort of on the fly. I beg your pardon. The balcony, you know. Well, they couldn't get married on account of the old folks were on speaking terms. So this Juliet, she takes a drug and knocks herself cold. Please. So what happens? So they stick her in a box and ship her off to a vault. It's as cold as a herring in there. And Romeo thinks she's a gunner. Just then, a fellow named Paris walks in, and they get into a scrap. Just a moment. What a battle. Romeo stabs Paris. Paris stabs Romeo. Will you please? Romeo stabs Paris. It's a fight to the finish, and the next thing you know, Paris is on the floor, stabbed through the skittles. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what was that? The skittles. So then Romeo... Stop it. Stop it at once. But that's not the end yet. Then Romeo... Be quiet. Now, Judge Hardrow, you see what I mean. I see, I see. You see the kind of bringing up she's had? What are we going to do with her? Put her in the eighth grade. She's wonderful. <laughs> eighth grade, he says. Put her in the eighth grade. <laughs> Here, Nazareth, have some more cider. Thank you. Uh, pretty good for a fellow that never had much book learning. What's book learning got to do with cider? I ain't talking about cider. I'm talking about educating Star so good that she jumps right into the eighth grade. You educating her? Why, you couldn't get into the third grade yourself. It was the things I learned that put her through. Why, you... Who is it? It's Winthrop, Captain. The minister. Oh, come in, sir. Come in. Morning, Captain. Morning, sir. Come in and sit down. Thank you. Morning, Nazro. Morning, Mr. Winthrop. What brings you all the way out here, Mr. Winthrop? If it's Star you came to see, she's in school. Eighth grade. I came to see you, January. In a way, I'm glad that Star isn't here. Huh? It's about her that I came to speak to you. Well, what is it? Is it bad news? Bad news and good. It depends on the way you look at it. Go on. Captain, a lady came to my house yesterday. A lady and a gentleman. Their name is Easton. They're visitors here. They asked me a lot about Star, about where she came from and how long ago. I told them about the night you found her on the beach. You told them? We talked for a long time, Captain. And I told them I would bring them out here tonight. You see, they want to take Star. They want to bring her to Boston to give her a home there. Why? Why? Because, because from what they told me, I have no doubt that, that Star is Mrs. Easton's niece. And all we heard was that my sister had been lost in a shipwreck. When we came back to America, we tried to learn more about it. But they told us that everyone had been lost. Then we came up here. When I saw the child, I almost knew then. She looked so much like my sister. And then the locket. I know she's my niece, Captain January. 
She's my sister's child. And what if she is, Captain? What if she is, I say? What have you done for her? Did you take her out of the sea, raging like the devil's let loose, and death itself howling for the child? Did you take her from her mother's arms and swear to the Lord as help in saving her, to do as should be done by her? Have you prayed and worked and sweated for her and lived in fear some day she'd be taken from you? Have you? Captain January, I ask your pardon, ma'am. Please believe me. I know what this means to you. And if it weren't for the child's own good, I wouldn't ask you to let me take her. We can give her everything she wants, Captain. A home, schooling, and more important, I think we can make her happy. For the child's own good. Ah, uh, there's a thought, isn't it? There's something to hold on to. You say you can prove that she's your niece. We have the passenger list from the Huntress. The mother and child were both registered. And then there's the locket. There was a picture in it. My sister and her baby, taken when she was a year old. My sister was wearing a white dress, smiling and looking down at the child. Is, is that picture still there? Yes, it's there. I don't think there's any question that Mrs. Easton is stars, Aunt Captain. No, there's no question. Then, then you'll let us take her. The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. It's his will, then. But I'll ask you to do it easy. For it's, it'll be sudden-like for the girl. And she ain't used to being took sudden, my ways being slow. We'll be very careful, Captain. Cap, where are you? <clears throat> Uh, oh. come in, Star, come in. This is uh, Mrs. Easton, and this is Mr. Easton. Hello, Star. Hello. You remember me, don't you? Sure. I met you on the docks one day. You were going to buy some lobsters from me. That's right. Well, I guess you folks want to talk. I'll go on upstairs. Oh, please don't go. You see, we want to talk to you. What about? Star, do you remember my asking about that locket you were wearing? May I see it now? I... I haven't got it. Where is it, Star? I haven't got it. I see. Star, you keep the locket in the box over there, don't you? I think you'd better get it for you, Star. Why does she want it? Why does she look at me like that? Because this lady is your aunt, Star. My aunt? Your own kin, darling. I haven't any kin. You know that. I haven't anybody except you. Tell her to go away. I don't want anybody looking at me the way she does. I don't belong to her. I belong to you. Easy, easy, darling. Helm, steady now. Star, your aunt wants to take you to live with her. Through the providence of God, she's been led here to you. And she feels it her duty to claim you in the name of your parents. I won't go with her. I've lived here ever since I can remember. She's got no right to make me leave. I won't go, do you hear? I won't go. Oh, Cap, why don't you say something? Don't you hear it? They're trying to take me away. They were right to you, child. A right to me. Is that all you have to say? Do you want me to go? Are you tired of me? Well, honey, I'm an old man now, a very old man, and an old man likes quiet, you see, and, well, I, I'd be quieter myself, and so maybe it's all for the best. You're lying to me. You never said anything like that to me before. You used to ask me all the time if I was lonesome here. All you thought about was me. And I'd tell you I'd never go away from you. And then you'd be happy. And now... And now... And now I tell you that I'm needing rest and quiet as suiting to an old man. I've kept you here for nine whole years, and what thanks do I get? What thanks for all the years of work I put in to bring you up decent? Hanging on me and hanging on me. And if you want me to say it right out, then I will. I want you to go off with those folks and let me alone. Let me alone. That, that's the way you feel about me? I do. All right, then. I'll go. I'll go and I'll never come back. Never. Never. Oh, may God forgive me for the things I said to the child. May God forgive me. He was only making believe. 
So please let me stay here, Lloyd. Let me stay with Cap. They can't take me away if he won't let them. And hiding that locket wasn't really dishonest, was it? And if it was, please forgive me. Because if they had that locket, then they'd know I belong to them. And I don't. I belong here. I belong to Cap. <laughs> please, Lord. Please let me stay. Please. Please. After a short intermission, Mr. DeMille and Shirley Temple, Charles Winninger, and Jean Lockhart will return for Act Three of Captain January. But first, let's listen a moment. Mary and Tom have been spending the evening with Tom's new boss and his wife. They're leaving now. Mary says... It was a lovely party, Mrs. Allen. I enjoyed it so much. This is what Mary is thinking. She's a cat. Even if she is the boss's wife, looking at my hands that way, I don't care if they are all red and rough from washing dishes. Tom can't afford a maid yet, and I'm glad to help him save money. I don't blame Mary for being mad at that snooty woman, Mr. Ruick. Neither do I, Sally. But I think we can help her. Of course. That's where new quick lux comes to the rescue. With a way to wash dishes that doesn't leave hands red and rough. You may not realize, unless you've actually used Lux Flakes for dishes, how different they are from many other soaps. We've proved that difference in the famous one-hand test. Hundreds of women took part in these tests of five popular dishwashing soaps. They were made in a well-known laboratory under conditions similar to home dishwashing and were absolutely impartial for each soap. When the tests were finished, the Lux hands looked soft, smooth, and attractive. The hands which had been in other soap suds were red, rough, and coarse-looking. Women can prove that difference right in their own homes, Mr. Ruick. Yes, indeed. Very easily. Just try New Quick Lux Flakes for your dishes, and you'll be delighted at how soft and smooth they leave your hands. You see, there's no harmful alkali in Lux, nothing to dry your skin. It's not only fast and thrifty, because a little goes so far, it's kinder to your hands. Why not get a big box of New Quick Lux Flakes tomorrow? They come in the same familiar package and don't cost you a cent more. We pause now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Curtain rises on the third act of Captain January. It's dawn of the next day. On the rocky beach near the lighthouse, Captain January stands looking out at the angry sea. All night long, he's walked the path between the rocks and the lighthouse gate. His hair is rumpled by the wind, his eyes bright and feverish. From the road comes Captain Nazro to stand quietly beside him. It's fixing up to storm. Aye. Glass been dropping all night. They blow in a gale by evening. Evening. They'll be coming for her then. They'll be coming for Star to take her away. January, I, I've been thinking things over. I was wondering if, well, it'll be mighty lonesome here for you for a while. Now, now, why don't you come into the village and, and live with me? Live with you? It ain't, ain't much of a place, but it's comfortable, and the food's good. And who'd be taking care of the light? Uh, uh well, uh, the light will take care of itself. You see, they're, they're going to install automatic e equipment. What's that? Look here. This, this telegram come last night. I'll let you read it yourself. On the 30th this month, automatic equipment will be installed in lighthouses 8, 9, and 10. Inform all keepers their services will be no longer required. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm sorry, Captain. Of course, there'll be a pension for you. 
A pension. <laughs> now, there's a fine life for an active man like myself. <laughs> Living on a pension. <laughs> easy, Captain. Easy. <laughs> Sitting in a soft chair, waiting for a check each month. <laughs> Nothing to do but wait and think. Easy, man. Easy now. Uh, why? You're sick, January. Y- you'd better come inside and lay down. I'm not sick. You're feverish, man. Come along. No! I can look out for myself. All right. I'll be in the village if you need me. Cap, I've been waiting all day for you to come back. What's the matter, Cap? Aren't you... Aren't you going to speak to me? There's nothing left to say. I only want to hear one thing. You weren't telling the truth last night, were you? You really don't want me to go, do you? Please, Cap, tell me. I'm trying to do what's best. I know you didn't mean it. You couldn't. I don't believe you any more than you'd believe me if I said I wanted to go. It's not a question of wanting. Why isn't it? They can't take me if I won't go. The locket's the only thing that proves anything. And they can't find it. No one will ever find it. There's more than the locket, Star. There's you. And the way you came here, and he... uh, Oh, I can't explain it to you. I can't think somehow. It's it's all dark and misty. You mean I I gotta go with him? Is that what you mean, Cap? Yes, Star. But not because you want me to go. You don't, do you? Want you to go. Would I want the sun never to rise again? Would I? (laughs) There, there now, there now. It's a fine life you'll have, darling. And I'll be coming to see you as often as they let me. Oftener, maybe. Ah, they're good people. Cap, what if they hadn't come up here? We'd go on living just the same, wouldn't we? You wouldn't be talking of a fine life then. We'd be happy just like before, wouldn't we? Yeah, but they did come. Then, Cap, why don't we run away? What's that you're saying? You were always talking about going somewhere else. Why don't we, Cap? Just you and me. We could take the sailboat. Now, before they come, we could be off down the coast where no one would know us. Star, don't be saying such things. I can't think like that. I can't. I tell you, I can't think. Put the food in the boat. We could sail for days and days. Oh, they'd find us. They'd bring us back. No, they wouldn't. Please, Cap. We'll be too late if we don't hurry. I'll get the boat ready now. We'll be gone before dark. It's the wrong thing, Star. It's wrong. It isn't wrong. And we're going, do you hear, Cap? We're going. Is everything aboard, Cap? All set. Get in the boat. Wait. I forgot about Imogene. I'll turn her loose and be right back. Hurry, Star. What are, you, what are you doing down here? Out of my way. I'm busy. You're going to take this boat out in a sea like this? I can handle any boat and in any kind of sea. Where are you going? I'm taking Star away down the coast. Don't be a fool. You can't do that, man. You're sick. Sick, am I? You're raging with the fever right now. Or you'd never be thinking of such a thing. Get out of my way, I tell you. I won't. You're not leaving with that child if I have to knock you down and sit on you. Now get off this boat. Get off! You know, Nazra, you and me have had a lot of fights. But I always thought that down deep you were my friend. I am your friend. My friend! You'd let them come here and take Star from me. And you call yourself my friend. January, it's for the best. January, come up to the lighthouse. Let me go! Let me go or I'll brain you! Are you crazy, man? Stop it! Let him go! Stop it! What are you doing to him? Let him alone! Star! You're not leaving here tonight. We are. We're running away. And no one's going to stop us. You or anybody. Star, he's not himself. Can't you see it? The man's raving mad. He's a sick man, Star. Sick? Would he be taking a boat out tonight if he knew what he was doing? Let me go. Any boat. In any sea. We're ready, Star. We're ready. We're... uh... Help. What's the matter? Uh... Help! Star. Uh, Go get the doctor. Quick. Is that 
all you can tell us, Doctor. That's all, Mrs. Easton. He may pull through, and then again, well, he's a very sick man. What about the little girl? I mean, her staying here. We don't want to take her away if, if it will have bad effects. It can't have. He's barely conscious now, and it might be just as well if she weren't here. I've already told her that she's to go with you. You'll keep us informed, won't you, Doctor? Of course. Shall we go, Laura? Where is Star? I've allowed her to see him for a moment. She'll be right down. When you wake up, I, I'm going to try to be back. And don't forget, you're going to come and see me whenever they'll let you, and maybe oftener. And when you're not there, I'm going to be thinking of you, Cap. I'm going to be thinking of you all the time. <laughs> I've been looking all over for you. Uncle Bruce will be back from New York soon. He'll want to see you. Yes, ma'am. Star, what's the matter? Nothing. Aren't you happy here, Star? You've been wonderful to me, Aunt Laura. I've never had such beautiful clothes and things. But that's not enough, is it? Oh, I don't mean it like that. I've had everything here. You and Uncle Bruce, why, you've been wonderful. You even took this beach house on account of me, thinking it might make me feel better, and... Well, it does, too, only... Star, dear, you don't have to explain it to me. I know how you feel. Have you... Have you heard any, anything from Cap lately? Well, just that he's a lot better. You've been writing to him every day, haven't you? Yes. He'd answer, too, but... Well, you know Cap. He isn't so strong on spelling. Aunt Laura, now that he's feeling better, do you suppose we could go and see him sometime? Well... We'll have to wait and see if Laura. It... Oh, there's Uncle Bruce. Come on, darling. He has a surprise for you. Hello, Laura. Well, Star. Hello, Uncle Bruce. Did you bring it, Bruce? I certainly did. Here, Star. Look out the window, down by the dock. Why, it's a boat. Like it? Oh, it's beautiful. It's almost a yacht, isn't it? <laughs> Pretty nearly. Come on down and take a look at it. Did you sail that from New York, Uncle Bruce? All the way. Started last night. It's awful big, isn't it? Don't argue with me, you old rattle brain. I've sailed tubs in every sea that was ever caught. Why, it's Cap! 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 Stop! 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 Me darling! Oh, Cap, I thought you'd forgotten. Forgotten you? Would I forget the north from the south, would I? How did you get here? What are you doing? I'm captain of this craft. That's what I'm doing. And I'm the first mate. Captain Nazro. Ah, uh, he's the second mate. I said first mate. Second. The first. Second. First. Second. Oh, gee. But it's wonderful to see you fellas on good, good terms again. In just a moment, Mr. DeMille will bring back our stars for a curtain call. But first, I promised Sally that she could say something to you about the Lux Flakes Gone with the Wind brooch. I want to tell our audience that I've been wearing this beautiful pin, and I've gotten more compliments on it. People think it's a family heirloom, and an expensive one at that because of its lovely simulated turquoise and pearls, and its fine-looking antique-style gold finish. It's round and big, too, almost two inches wide. It dresses up a simple daytime dress, and it's perfect for afternoon and evening wear, too. It's stunning pinned on one of those plain fabric handbags or at the front of a turban. And something else we women appreciate. It has a safety clasp so it won't drop off and get lost. Oh, but I'm sure you want to know how to get this gorgeous brooch. Mr. Ruick will tell you. Well, first, buy a big box of Lux Flakes. You'll want these for all sorts of things. Stockings, underthings, sweaters, other nice things... And for your dishes, too. Remember, new Quick Lux is fast, thrifty, safe. Then, tear off the opening tab of the box and mail it with 15 cents in coin. Please don't send stamps. 
to Lux, Box 1, New York City. Lux, Box 1, New York City. Be sure to include your name and address, of course. You'll get your lovely Gone with the Wind brooch very soon. And with it can, comes an illustrated order blank for matching pieces, bracelet, earrings, and so on. All amazing bargains. Now, don't delay, because this Gone with the Wind brooch offer is strictly limited, and we know how popular these stunning brooches will be. Remember, send your name and address, 15 cents in coin, and the opening tab from a large box of new Quick Lux Flakes to Lux, Box 1, New York City. This offer is good only in the United States. Now, here's Mr. DeMille with our stars. Now, Shirley Temple returns to the microphone, flanked by those two attentive seafaring gentlemen, Charles Weninger and Jean Lockhart. I guess I'm pretty lucky to have two escorts like this. It's an honor, Miss Temple. Ma'am. My sentiments exactly, ma'am. My goodness, gentlemen. Don't be so formal. We all work here. <laughs> and you all work well, too. Uh, how are things going in school, Shirley? Fine, Mr. Winninger. Say, you know, I just found out that you learn a lot of things in school that you might use sometime instead of just keeping them in your head. Hmm. I was a lot older than you, Shirley, before I discovered that. How did you find it out? One thing I learned in school was how to write letters. So now that my brother's gone away with the Marines, I can write and tell him how we all are here at home. And I'll bet he's glad to get those letters. Uh, where'd he go? He went to Hawaii. I think he's going to be there for a whole year. Well, Shirley, the next time you write, wish him good luck from all of us. And that's a wish we send to all those young men now serving these United States. Yes, sir. I'll tell my brother. Say, Mr. DeMille... Would you tell me what play you're going to have next week? I'll tell everybody, Shirley. Next Monday night, we're going to present Rebecca. And our stars will be Ronald Coleman, Joan Fontaine, and Judith Anderson. And as a special guest, we'll have the producer of the picture, David O. Selznick. The novel was talked about around the world, and Mr. Selznick's fine motion picture was selected as the leading film of the year in the film daily poll of 546 motion picture critics. It's a great love story and a great drama. So tense and exciting, it held audiences right on the edge of their chairs. Next week, Rebecca promises to give this stage one of its most brilliant evenings. I certainly agree with you there, C.B., and I'll be listening. Well, I guess it's time to go home now, Shirley. Good night. Bye, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night, Charlie. Jim. I wish I had your future, Shirley. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Ronald Coleman, Joan Fontaine, and Judith Anderson in Rebecca. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. Shirley Temple will soon begin a picture at Metro Goldwyn Mayer Studios. Charles Winninger will be seen in the forthcoming MGM picture, Ziegfeld Girl. Gene Lockhart will be seen in the Warner Brothers production, The Sea Wolf. Heard in tonight's play were Dwayne Thompson as Mrs. Easton, Verna Felton as Mrs. Morgan, Griff Barnett as Mr. Winthrop, Bobby Winkler as Gerald, Earl Ross as Mr. Easton, Lou Merrill as Judge Hardrow, Charles Seal as storekeeper, and Bob Burleson as doctor. This broadcast was made with the permission of L.C. Page and Company, publisher and copyright owners of Laura Richards' novel, Captain January. The brooch offered you by the makers of Lux Flakes was designed from one worn in Gone with the Wind, the Selznick International Picture, produced by David O. Selznick and released by Metro Golden Mayer. Our music is directed by Louis Silvers, and your announcer has been Melville Ruick. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>